Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Welcome to the next episode of season nine and a half of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. This is the weekly podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalog, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. This is another special non-petty episode of the podcast with the fantastic Jake Thistle, who found time in his insanely busy schedule to sit down with me to discuss his label debut, The Half Left Out. We chatted a little bit about Gainesville and Tom, of course, but mainly we dug into the weeds around his full debut release uh, with topics ranging from album sequencing, how different producers bring different perspectives to songs, and how to avoid cliche. And Jake has a fairly direct way of dealing with that one. Um, we also dug into the brilliant video for Brooklyn Can Wait and talked through each track on the album in a little more depth. Jake has a new live album coming out sometime in the next few months and already has demos recorded for most of a new studio recording which will be coming out sometime, hopefully soon. Um, in the meantime, make sure you check out jakethistle.com uh, and go support Jake at a live show if he's playing anywhere near you. For now, though, sit back, relax, and enjoy my second conversation with Jake Thistle. Tom Petty. Tom Petty Project. Tom Petty. Okay, so how's life? I mean, it's been, I was looking through, it's been a, just about two years since you were last wow. on the podcast. So it, it's been a while. There's a lot has happened in the last two years for you. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it went quick for sure. Yeah. But uh, I'm very happy to be back. Yeah, things have been great. I've been keeping really, really busy and, uh, you know, enjoying uh, being busy. So they work yeah, together. I mean, when I was, you know, obviously following on Facebook and whatnot, the, the touring, like the gigging, the recording, the writing, the work for, you know, different charities, as well as a full academic load. Are you still doing okay? Like everything's still, you still managing all that okay? Yeah, so far so good. Yeah. Um, today was, uh, before this, primarily a homework day. So right. I, I am more than welcoming this conversation because it, it's uh, it's nice to switch gears a little bit. But yeah, things have been good. I, I, uh, I'm a double major uh, communication and journalism. So it's a lot of writing and a lot of PR talk and, and things like that, but yeah, that's been great. It helps me in a variety of ways for the music stuff, which is why I picked it because they're, I mean, in addition to being a ridiculously versatile and large major, both of them, uh, you know, it, it helps me work with the publicist and it helps me write and kind of learn human interests and things like that, which I think help the songwriting a lot too. So, you know, they're a little more blended than I often give them credit for, but uh, it, it's been great. Well, and it, of course, you know, in a in the modern era where an independent artist, you sort of have to be your own PR guy. You have to be in charge of your own social media. You have to right. do all those things. So having that background, that education in better ways or more efficient ways of doing that, um, it's always going to be a burden. I was thinking too that, you know, your friend Jeff Slate oh, has yeah. that background too. So if you ever have any questions on the journalism side, especially, you've got a resource there that you can lean on, right? That's right. Yeah, he was a... Um... He was a journalism major, political science minor, and that was what I initially was going in for. Right. Um, so that was great. I since then I they don't let me minor because I have the double major. Okay, that's how. I mean, I think I could probably convince him if I worked hard enough. The the sky does school, school communication information department, but uh, I'm not going to try to convince them to let me do more work. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, he's been a uh, he's been a good resource for for sure. When I was looking on back on your website again yesterday, prepping for this, and I just wanted to read this quote from you again from, again, a, a friend, a mentor. It says, Jake Thistle is a star of the future today. His stage presence, vocal abilities, and superb guitar and keyboard skills put him in a league with the best in the business. Jake has carved a path for himself as a true road warrior, a musician worthy of your attention and one to keep an eye on for sure. So being friends with someone like Jeff, who's been around the block and has worked with some of the, the biggest names, that must be that must mean something when Jeff writes something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he's been, you know, I've known him now for I think five or six years. It's, it's been quite a long time. And, you know, I'm always really, really grateful that, you know, he brings me around and, and, and everything like that. And I think we, we've developed a, a really good, you know, relationship. And I mean, more than anyone, honestly, I, we've, I've traveled with him, I think more than <laughs> any, we, we do the thing in Gainesville and I've been to LA with him and, you know, we're, we're trying to get some more stuff on the books. And so, yeah. you know, it's been a ton of fun. And it's, it's, he's uh he's a really great resource. And I, especially because I love to write, 
he's he's a good resource for that too because i'd love to get into that at some point definitely yeah and so talk about that in a little bit because obviously we're going to get into your album that's really why i wanted to talk to you mainly uh, today but talk about the highlights from sort of these last couple of years or certainly last last year especially going down to Gainesville is a big part of the calendar for any of us Tom Ferry fans and I'm finally going to get to go this year so I'm really hoping oh, that both great. you and Jeff are there because I don't want to be able to get to see you live so I am too yeah. yeah yeah last I I mean uh, last I uh, talked to him I, I, I think that's what we're planning on um, yeah I haven't I, I'm not going to put words in his mouth but um, yeah. I uh, yeah I, I plan on it you know I haven't uh, I don't think I'm confirmed for it yet but I'm sure I will be shortly. I, I, I as long as they have me, I, I always like being down there. And are you going to do shows from down there? That'd be great. I'm hoping so. Yeah, I'm hoping to get. I've been talking with Dan, the producer. Yeah, yeah. We were going to look at it last year, but it didn't. It didn't pan out. So I'm hoping that I'll do a petty trivia, or we'll do a, a round table, or with a few people. And that'd be kind of. It'd be so cool to do that, right? Just to be involved yeah. would be was so nice. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sure he would. You know, it'd be awesome to set up. They have a good space there for like a press area. You know. Yeah. On Petty Project next to the Mark Felsot tent and like all this stuff. That, that, <laughs> we could all just go down the line like a conveyor belt. Yeah. I think that'd be, that'd be great. That'd be a great part of the press junket. Oh man, that'd be a dream come true for me. <laughs> <laughs> We've also had some other highlights uh, last year. So Americana Song of the Year for Boulevard Thank magazine you. and I the NJArts.com uh, Brooklyn Come Wait was number 50. I think that was fairly recent in their list of New Jersey based songs. And it's in there with some, some pretty big. Some pretty big names and some pretty big songs, right? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was very unexpected. So I'm I'm really grateful uh, for that. That came out a couple of days, I think, yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that's that's some incredible company. So I, I was really really grateful. Um, and I think it's it was uh, in the top fifty of you know all time songs out of New Jersey. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know necessarily uh, how I think you know I don't know how I feel about that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, you're, I think you're too close to it. To, I mean, a lot of the people say that. And I, I was going to ask that because I like asking artists this. I asked Jeff this when I spoke to him fairly recently. How do you take when someone says, when you get an award like that or, or some you get recognition like that, are you able to take that at face value? Or do you just think, really? Did, did, they, did they mean me? Did they know I'm just kind of this this chance? Because I always think that, they get, do you still have imposter syndrome or have you kind of got around that a little bit now? Because I think being able to accept compliments is difficult for some people, especially artists. But I think it is an important thing because when people give you compliments and include you in these lists, they are being sincere, you know? Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I think there I think there will always be an an inherent level of, of that. You know, just because like, even like a song like Brooklyn Can Wait, like I'm I'm so grateful for that response. You know, and of course the first thing I, I say is kind of like, oh well that's kind of strange. I, I didn't expect that at all. You know, I, I, I don't put out these songs thinking, oh, they're gonna this is going to be the Grammy, you yeah. know, but um, I, I think there's a lot to be said about the fact that, you know, I wrote that song when I was just like hunched over here at three in the morning, like exhausted with a cup of coffee, like, let me just write a song. And then I wrote the song the next week when I'm like cutting out all these verses. And, you know, I wrote it when I'm like messing up the bass line in the studio yeah. and stuff. Like I've, I've seen all of these like awkward stages of the song. Uh, and so I think that kind of trains the artist to sort of go, oh, I don't know why they chose that. But I suppose if it, it's probably a different thing, you know, seeing the finished polished touch. Yeah. Just saying, yep, did it in five minutes. What are you going to do? I'm great. You know, like that type of thing. Um, I think a lot of the time that, that sort of attitude is easier said than done just because we've seen it evolve or not evolve over such a long period of time. Well, I think that that's one thing that I've always sort of the parallel, the main parallel I've always drawn between you and Jackson Brown and Tom Petty and those guys is, you know, because obviously you get there's the similarity in the styles sometimes and a similarity sometimes in your vocals, but it's more that work ethic and getting through the catalog. I'm, I'm just getting into Wildflowers now for this next season. So into the great wide open Wildflowers, it's at that point that Tom it doesn't, he's not chasing hits anymore, right? I mean, obviously the, well, the label's got one eye on that. But Tom's just looking at the song and he, and he always did sort of, the song is the most important thing. And I always get that sense with you too, that, well, all I have to do is worry about making this next song as good as I can possibly make this next song. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's an incredible way to think. And it's funny, you know, just inherently being a young person doing this, I always get the question of like, what? So, you you know, what do you want to do? Like, you you want to be at the garden? Like, what what is your yeah. plan? And my, my answer is always just, to do music at, at in some capacity at some point support myself even if it's just on the side whatever because i love it and that's what i want to do yeah. but uh 
it is uh, that is a, a factor I envy a, a little bit. I have to say is like that whole like Tom Petty thing at when he's coming up with Wildflowers or Mojo or like any of these albums that are kind of just like a defining point of like holy crap. That's what he did yep. when he do anything he wanted because he was Tom Petty and he didn't, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he didn't, you know, and again, I, I'm, I, I don't know his mental state at the time, but I'm sure, you know, when you're writing, you, you got to get it. You're going to get it. Like you have to think, all right, well, I kind of need an American girl type song on this. Right. Cause yeah. I would love this record to do that, you know? And I'm, uh, you know, or like even like the Springsteen stuff, I'm a huge fan of um, the Western stars album. Right, with like this great kind of off the beaten path concept album that he did that that just kind of blew my mind. But I'm not sure, you know, I don't think he would have been able to do that in the, you know, I, I think Darkness would have had to come out before yeah. that, before her own. Uh, so if I was ever able to get to something like that, I think that would be a lot of fun. Well, it's, it's funny that you brought that up because you're going to get it is obviously the second album in the Heartbreakers catalog. And Tom famously said once that, you know, you get your whole life to write your first album. You get nine months to write your second one. Right, so you're in that yeah, you're now. in that position where <laughs> exactly right. So you've got down the line is your album that you self produced and then wrote and recorded everything yourself, and then obviously I think you probably got some mixing done somewhere else. But but going into the studio with a, a set of songs now where you sign a record contract, and now it's probably a little bit more quote unquote real. It's like oh man, I think I've got to bring my A game now. So what was the process for like where did how quickly did that set of songs that become the half left out? How long did how quickly did they come together? I feel like I kind of, I, I feel like I kind of got a redo of that my whole life thing because, right. you know, the half left, uh, uh, down the line came out in 2020. I was 16 and I had these songs from when I was 14, 15, whatever. Uh, most of them though were from that year. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just did it in a soundboard. I mixed it myself and I just took out the SD card and put it in the computer. That was it. Like I didn't use any, anything. <laughs> like, uh, I did it. Like, I, I think it was like, a, I have a talent of finding the hardest way possible to do something. Uh, and then four years, you know, give or take three years went by. Uh, now I'm working with Golden Retriever Records or whatever. I have these songs over four, three, two years, whatever. Right. It also weren't written for that. It was like, a lot of them were, but you know, a lot of those songs are pretty old. The Dreamer, I think, was the oldest one. That was from 2021. Yeah. And and so it was definitely a little bit more pressure than down the line because it was industry backed and they needed it by a deadline whatever but this album that i'm writing now is really the first one where i'm sitting down and go you know the half left out came out in november we're yep. shooting to be recording the next album you know sometime late spring early summer through you know maybe to get it out fall you know those are all circumstantial right now but um this is the first time i've really felt that sort of like pit in your stomach of like all right i hope we get one today you know uh so I'm excited, though. It excites me. Uh, I think it's a different way to write. So when you get into the studio, then, the question, I think I'd ask you this maybe when I, because obviously I, I covered, I did an episode, a non-petty episode, the only one I've done so far, I could do more of those, on Ghosted Road. Thank which you. I really enjoyed digging into that song at a, you know, that sort of micro level, and you were very gracious to send me some notes back. But when you go in, obviously you've got these songs in either acoustic or piano and some general idea of how you want to arrange them in your head. But how much does, does the studio and the producer and the musicians you're working with affect and, and inform how those arrangements develop in the studio? I, it's really a big help to get other ears on it. I, I've i always tried to make as elaborate demos as I can. Uh, so for most of the half left out, and prior to that, I was doing it on the same soundboard, like the same way I recorded down the line. So I didn't have too much uh, flexibility because I can put a guitar track and a vocal track and a bass track, whatever. I can't play drums, you know, whatever it is. I have the sounds that my keyboard has. So, uh, you know, the producer, uh, especially, um, we worked with two producers on this, uh, 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 Jacob Kulik, and uh, he, he has uh, with uh, with April Rose Gabrielli, they have uh, this uh, producing thing called The Pair. Now they're with Interstate Music. They have a Music Row studio in Nashville. Um, oh, and, wow. Yeah, it was incredible. I worked with them on the session. We typically did two songs at a time for the half left out. And right. we did Ghosted Road, Rolling Away at the same two-day session. Um, and then a year went by. Ghosted Road had already been out. This was July. Ghosted Road came out in December. And then the new year started. And now 
we're we're back trying to mix the record. We're in, uh, so I guess we recorded Ghost of the Road July of twenty two. Okay, like December of twenty two. Now we're in summer twenty twenty three. I've got a bunch of other stuff written and re- we're recording and rolling away. I just I'm listening to it and Ghost of the Road had already been out, but I just wasn't happy with it. Um, it just I don't know. It didn't fit. It was I, I thought it was kind of seventies in a bad way. You okay. know. Which is not something I usually, I think 70s is a good way, but I don't know. I don't know what's, you, I'll send it to you. You'll have to let me know what you think. Yeah, anyway, sure. So they were living in Pennsylvania and we recorded in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And, um, I, you know, we were talking, this might've been Thursday or something. Hey, yep. you know, I'm going to redo Rolling Away. We're going to go, all right, I'll come to your place in Pennsylvania. So then I get a call on like that Saturday or something. And we were supposed to do this on Tuesday. And he's like, Hey, last minute, I, we moved to Nashville. It's a great opportunity. So he's like, we can leave like one mic at the old place if you want and, you know, do it there. I'm like, no, I'm going to come to Nashville. Are you crazy? I've always wanted to get there. So that was, it was my first time in Nashville. And it was such a blast to just, they, they brought me around town and they were very, very gracious hosts. But uh, yeah, so that we did Rolling Away twice. And the second time, the one that's on the record was from Nashville. Um, it's really yeah. interesting. Thank you. I, I, I thought so too. I, I yeah. Was, Hoping a label would think the same thing when they were sending me to Nashville, but they liked it too. That was good. Uh, and then the other producer uh, who produced um, the other five on the, on the record was uh, Tyler Sarfit, and he was really a huge help in kind of developing that sound uh, that I, I think the album turned into. I was he's really the first one that introduced me to you know that kind of like synthesizer-y pad yep. swirl atmospheric stuff, and that was something I always liked but was a little too ambitious for me to figure out on my own yeah. so i'm really grateful for all the work he put into that and now that we've done it i'm i i've since then i've gotten smarter and and i bought logic and i'm now making demos for real in the computer and i'm adding all of those components in so uh the demos for the new album are far more intricate than anything i've ever done but i'm sure I haven't sent them to any producers yet, but once I do, I'm sure they will also put a really cool spin on it that I can't even imagine as we're talking now. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just that's part of the process, though, right? But it's interesting to me that... So Brooklyn Can Wait, then, and Rolling Away are, were different producers in different locations because I was going to make a comment on this and we're going to dig into the songs, hopefully, that those two bookend this set of songs just superbly and they kind of feel of a piece. They, they they match sonically. There's a there's a sort of through line between both of them. So the fact that they were recorded at different times in different locations, that's like I said, that's really interesting to me. That that, that you Thank you. you still got that cohesion out of a process like that that's a little bit more fragmented. I appreciate you saying that because I was kind of on purpose. You know, I was I, I we didn't have when I recorded um the timeline for everything, we did Ghosted Road in July of twenty two. Yeah. And then the Dreamer keeping it alive in December of twenty two. And then we did Brooklyn Can Wait in June of 23, uh, Rolling Away in August of 23, and then Brain Freeze and Half Beats Nothing in September of 23. Okay. So I had already, I had all the songs written and I was really trying, even though I hadn't recorded them yet, I was still trying to sequence the record and that's something I, I'm always intimidated by, but also care extremely about. Uh, and, uh. I kind of wanted Rolling Away to be last, but I didn't think what we had. I mean, it's fine for an album track. Uh, yeah. What we had originally. I mean, I was very proud of it at the time, and, and I still think it's cool. I'm sure it'll be put out sometime. But um, I just didn't think it was a, it was a closer on the record, and I didn't think it. Having heard what ended up being Brooklyn Can Wait, and knowing that that was going to probably start the record, it just I wanted something that fit a little better and kind of made it full circle and everything. Yeah. The original Rolling Away we recorded with the full band, uh, okay, you know, was Ghosted Road, Rolling Away, the OG Rolling Away, and then the Dreamer and Keeping It Alive. We recorded full band in the studio, me on vocals and guitar, a lead guitar player, a bass player, and a drummer. Uh, but the other three was it was just me and Tyler, uh, well, me and and Jake Kulik, you know, down in Nashville for Rolling Away, and April Rose Gabrielli, and the other one's just me and Tyler sitting in the studio, like trying out different basses and synthesizers and stuff. And yeah, and those are some of my favorite songs. I, I play with all those musicians, the band that we, we still play. And that's like my general touring band these days. And they're really, really great. It had nothing to do with, with them and their playing, but I really liked 
being able to fine tune everything on, on our own as opposed to yeah just hitting record and hoping for the best well i mean a great album should have a great closer and it is important that stuff right and it's kind of cool that again i mean i don't always like leaning into the fact that you are pretty young still but, but to have that ear still to say you know what it's good enough but maybe good enough isn't quite maybe that's not enough maybe i can make it better so having that sort of presence and where with all to say let's let's just rethink this and re go back and redo this i think that shows and i mean it's nice too that you've got a label who would be open to that right because obviously you've spent a bit of money already recording it once yeah. so wanting to go and do it again well you, you know there's a bit of trust there that you need from the the people who are paying the money right yeah yeah i was really hoping they'd go for it we, you know when we went the first time i met with my label which i guess was january of 22 uh the head of my label joe riccatelli he was at um rca he was president over there for a little bit and then you know he oh, formed wow. retriever records uh you know, and, and then, you know, eventually he, you know, he stepped down from that because he didn't want to send a million emails a day and, and, you know, work at, you know, such high up at Sony Music and everything. So yeah. he was just being Golden Retriever. Uh, we have a mutual friend, Tom Cunningham, who hosts uh, Springsteen on Sundays uh, on One on One The Boss, uh, you know, here in Jersey. And I was on his show and Joe had heard me on that. And that's how we, we met. And I, I, I met with him in his office and I, you know, I brought my acoustic and I played him Ghosted Road and Rolling Away were the first two that I played him. And immediately we decided Rolling Away was going to be the first single that I put out. And, you know, and we went in the studio thinking that, but we left the studio thinking it was going to be Ghosted Road. Yeah. So I've already known at least, not that they were disappointed, but that his expectations were at least subverted to a different song. So I went into it kind of hoping he'd remember that. You know, remember this song you thought would even be single, but we didn't think it was, you know, we thought Ghosted Road was yeah. better. Uh you know, just because by nature, I mean, when I, the first time I played a Rolling Away, it was like six and a half minutes long. It was like a long song. I cut out three verses and two bridges. <laughs> uh, but eventually, once I cut it down and we were working on it, Rolling Away has a kind of a catchier, shorter chorus, and it's like three and a half minutes. Um, yeah. On the record, it's like two something because we sped it up like crazy. But um, uh, the original oh, one okay. was faster, uh, was slower. So it was like, you know, 3.30, whatever. And Ghosted Road has a longer chorus and more of a windy structure, and it's like four and a half minutes. So we always assumed that Rolling Away was going to be the single. Uh, so when we switched to Ghosted Road, I kind of banked on them remembering that and being like, all right, remember, let's just do this for real. That's super cool. I mean, you talk about sequencing being important, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think album, or sorry, single release schedule or whatever you want, or the sequence you do that, it is also important. I think that Ghosted Road, is it is the natural first single off this album even though brooklyn can wait opens it there's something that's just a bit more i think if people are fans of jake thistle ghosted road's easy right that's like okay i'm in safe yeah. territory here this sounds like jake he's not taking me too far into any sort of area while well, it's this a great song i mean i love the push on the chorus the big stop and then Thank stays just I, I told you that i just love that that break but let's get into the songs here then brooklyn can wait is you know when when you release that one because i think it was Ghosted Road first, The Dream is second, and then yeah. Brooklyn Can Wait was the third single, right? Yeah. And it blew my legs off. I was like, what the, are you kidding me? Like, Because I thought Ghosted Road, that's going to be, you know, from from the outside, well, that's going to be the strongest song because it's the lead single. It's great. I love it. It's, the instrumentation's great. Brooklyn Can Wait comes out. I was like, oh, no, hang on a minute. This is something completely different now. And so I was wondering about the the sort of the origins of that song, how it started and how that grew, because the arrangement you end up with, like you said, with those big synth pads, isn't something that you were going to have done on the demo, I'm assuming. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The original plan, you know, you know how you mentioned it, you know, the first one sounds like Jake, and then and then I slowly kind of build up to like a different sound. Yeah. Um, I wish I could say that was on purpose, but really that was just me trying to talk myself into it as well. Uh, I came in the studio... You know, and these days when I look back at it, it's so funny, but, you know, kind of nervous. I was like, okay, I'm working with a label and like, I don't want them to turn me into like a, not that they would have, but yeah, a, a dance, you know, microphone on my ear and like, you know, doing backflips, like just, you know, like Justin Timberlake or something. Uh, and I was worried about that. I don't really know why. And I was working, you know, with Jake and, and that was great. His music is a little more pop than mine. He is a, you know, his music is under Kulik. It's, he's, a, he's a great writer. Um, and then when we did The Dreamer and Keeping It Alive, we used Tyler, who is is much more of a pop mind than me. Right. Uh, 
but we went in with the full band and um you know he uh he did a great job but we we really kept him reined into like the ghosted road sound and a little more of like rock and and trying to keep it like that and we went in with the full band we had rehearsed a bunch so we just came in knew our parts and did it so there was not even that much to talk about really so he did a great job um but i remember uh the owner of the studio uh john Liedersdorf, who's an awesome guy he's 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 one of the coolest guys in the area you know he had said oh i love those i love what you did with tyler it doesn't really it didn't even really i didn't think that's what tyler you know would have done with you that that was pretty cool and i said oh yeah well we brought the band he's like you should just just see what happens if you let tyler be tyler you know right. don't band whatever and i said oh, no okay um I didn't know what I was going to give him, but it ended up the next song was Brooklyn Can Wait. And and yeah, I wrote, Brooklyn Can Wait, I think was the last one I wrote for the record. So um, we were supposed to, the next single was going to be Brain Freeze. Um, uh, we hadn't recorded it yet, but just just in the writing pattern, that's what we figured would, would be next. Right. And it was going to be a little weird because it was going to be the summer and, you know, Brain Freeze. Like we didn't know how we were going to like angle it. Uh, and I wrote Brooklyn Can Wait and I think March or April, um, you know, of 23. And immediately my label just kind of really was turned on to it and said, all right, that's going to be next. And we, that's the only song we did in a one day session. Everything else, we did two songs over two days. Uh, but Brooklyn Can Wait, we said, let's just do this as a standalone session. Let's right. not put the, a, a B side on it. So we just went in, you know, I don't know, 10 AM and had it by seven or eight. Um, but it was oh, just me. And the, it was the first time I'd ever worked with just me and a producer. Right. Um, no band. I, I did the, you know, he, he's a great drummer, Tyler. So um, they are real drums. You know, a lot of that half beats, nothing. Brain freeze, not so much, but half beats, nothing. And broken great people often think they're machines or, or you know, like uh, logic percussion. And there is a lot of that in there too. Yeah. But he played all those drum parts um, mostly. And, and I mean, they, I was so happy with how he played it. Um, but yeah, Brooklyn Can Wait was weird. I, I wrote it in one take, basically. Like it was kind of like that I, sort of wildflowers thing, you know, where he's just, he kind of just like said whatever the hell and it ended up being yeah. wild. Like that's kind of how it happened. I was sitting at the piano. I mean, it sounded different. It was, it was slower and sort of swung like, but um, right. Um, but the lyrically, um, I ended up cutting a lot, but mo uh, about 98% of the words that are in there were from just that first voice memo of me kind of just looking around the room and saying whatever, uh, which doesn't really happen to me usually. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Lines on the Road I wrote, which is from down the line, I, I wrote that in like eight or nine months. Like, to, like if it doesn't happen in 10 minutes, it's not happening for five months, <laughs> for better or worse. So Broken King Wave was just a quick one. And, uh, you know, it, it, it had seen a lot of evolution since then. And I cut a lot out. Um, some of the original kind of gimmicks of the song I ended up taking out. Originally, every verse was going to end with like a classic American novel, which is why the first verse ends with the postman always rings twice. Um, that one I just, hey. kept. I just thought that fit. Yeah. But I was also going to talk. I forget what the other ones were. The Sun Also Rises was definitely in there because that rhymes with rise. Yeah, um, yeah. I forget what the other ones were, but, you know, so I took that to the label. They immediately liked it. And uh, and that's why I, they said, let's just do this next and and ended up, you know, streaming the best by far. You know, I think that one sits at like 60, 62,000, something like that. And then the others are like, you know, 30, you know. Oh, yeah, you're way up there. I mean, it's I think, though, it, it's funny now that I know that, that you said that it came quickly. I think that's maybe, I think that's why the lyrics have the charm that they do. Then, is because they're not, they're not poured over in a good way, right? Where you're not second guessing it, you're not, you're trusting that instinct. Because I know I was, last time I spoke to you, remember you telling me that you you tend to overwrite and you write lots and lots and that, and then pair it back. But it's better to do that than not to have any ideas. Yeah. But I mean, for me, the the whole hook in that song is that vocal melody line. Ta -da. So how quickly did that motif come? Because once you've got that. I think it's one of those little things when you write a song, you think, yeah, there's something here that works. I can, I can hang everything else around that and build out from that. Yeah. That was something I, you know, I had had that, you know, 
sort of uh, chord progression for a while. Yeah. That wasn't new. I, I And I just couldn't, but it sounded different. You know, it, it didn't sound like how it ended up being. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out what to really do. And then I just started like humming melodies and trying different stuff. And then, you know, I, I tend to just say random words a lot. You know, like usually I say the sentence, like I usually say, I, I you know, I don't know what I'm doing. It's like what I typically I say. But for whatever reason, this time I just said, check the mail, go outside. And like, I was like, all right. And I just started writing it and then I started the thing. Um, and, you know, I had been looking to write. Uh, Brooklyn just seemed like, a, you know, I like being there. Um, it's yeah. kind of right around the corner. So it just seemed like a good thing to say. I, you know, it, it just it, it fit the syllables on you. Manhattan had an extra syllable and yeah. Queen one too too little and so it just ended up being that um I, there's no real s- super deeper meaning other than the fact yeah. that i think brooklyn is such an interesting and vibrant place just in terms of how it's you know coming up again and you know yeah the way it, it's it's kind of bustling now well i think too though that there's, there's a danger always when you start using brooklyn or california or where it can feel a bit contrived but because yeah. you're you know that's where you where you're from, and you know it. Then it just it's believable when you sing it. If I wrote a song about Brooklyn, I can't sell that, right? Because I'm from Wigan. I'm from a coal mine inside of the Northwest. Everyone's everyone's going to say, "We talking about you, Eddie? You can't sing about Brooklyn, right?" But because you do it, there's that authenticity to it that that carries it. But let's talk a little bit of the video too, because obviously we're talking about Brooklyn, the mm-hmm. shots about Brooklyn. So what incredible casting to find this actress who can convey this. It's got this, she's got this youthful vulnerability, but there's that undercurrent of sort of optimism and there's a quiet strength to her that match that optimism and that sort of the, the, the lilt of the song. So how involved in the video were you? Was that sort of pitched to you or did you have some sort of creative input and storyboarding and that kind of thing? Yeah, a little bit. You know, I, I you know, she was great. Uh, uh, that's Vernie, uh, Vernie Reich. She was through um, the label. She was a mutual friend of Joe's somehow and, and okay. she was studying in New York. So it was just, a, it was a good natural fit Typically for the videos, I, you know, we, we will get a director for it or whatever. And I'll just say, you know, they'll ask me, I say, I don't care, do what you want, but then let me see it at, before we do it. Yeah. Because I don't have a good, I, I'm, I guess like maybe I have a good eye for that. I really don't even know. Um, But I, I would just, I found I'd rather be writing the next song than like sitting there like, all right, <laughs> like, are we going to be on the bridge? And okay, now we're going to be in a coffee shop and like, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. It's just not, it's not how I... I don't. I don't know if it's not how I think, but it's just not how I choose to. I guess I don't. I don't know. And yeah. I know very well that whoever we hire to do it is going to do a better job than me anyway. So Perfect. we may have to let them get the first crack at it. But I, I was pretty vocal about wanting to do something different than the Dreamer, which is yeah. a video where I'm just kind of traipsing around Montclair, lip syncing, which was great. And that director did a great job too. I'm not putting it down, but I just felt like I'd done it and it was good. It was fine. Yeah. Uh, and in the same sense, the Ghosted Road video was different from that. You know, that was like in the studio and all intercut. So I wanted to do something different again. Yeah. Um, and I just thought it'd be cool to, um, I thought it was a cool idea to have me play all of these unrelated extras. Yeah. You know, kind of like what, I don't know, if, have you ever seen the show Scrubs? Yes. Yep. So I was kind of thinking about it like the Colin Hay episode. Okay. He's like right. it's playing overkill on the bench and JD's like, oh what? And then like he's in the morgue, you know, playing it and like Yeah. I get maybe they're the same guy, maybe they're not. Like I have to rewatch the episode. But that that was kind of what I was thinking. I wanted to do something like that. So that's why, you know, I'm the busker in the subway and I'm the guy that's getting his hair cut and everything like that. I don't know if everybody got that. Uh just having talked to some people, uh holding everybody understood that that was what was happening. But that was my intent. And uh the director for that was the same guy. Johnny Cervais, uh, who he um, he was also the videographer for Ghosted Road. Um, okay, and he you know he put it together. I guess he was the director. We hired him to uh, you know just shoot some of that Ghosted Road session when we were there, and it turned into the video. I don't know if that was the initial plan, but right. it probably was, and I just <laughs> don't remember. But uh, and he did a great job. That w- that was a lot of fun. Well, the Ghosted Road video is great too because you, you all look so relaxed, right? I mean, those behind the scenes things too, especially for for nerds and fans, it's like you want to go, what instrument is that? Oh, it's like, oh, look at that guitar there. How's this drum set up? Like, what's, you know, so getting to see that is kind of cool. But what I love about the video for Brooklyn is because 
and I, again, I don't know how much of this is deliberate time, which because we sort of backfill meaning into things all the time, right? But because she's on her own in that, she, you don't really see her interacting with anyone in the relationship. She's on mm-hmm. her own, like she's alone, right? And that's that whole thing. And like I said, I think I posted on your YouTube channel that the the line that just kills me in that song is, "You can move away from home, but it'll miss you." And mm-hmm. to have that, have her isolated in that way, kind of punches that home. Like I said, because I mean, I moved out of home when I was sixteen. I joined the army. And then I moved away from home again and moved to continent and moved to Canada. So you can move away from home, but it'll miss you really, really resonates for me because you sort of, when you move, you think about it selfishly. You think, well, I miss home. I miss my mom. I miss this. I miss that. But you forget also that there are people and there are reasons why they might miss you. So that, except money, it's such a good line. There's there's always one. You'll have Eddie in that way as well, right? There's always one line in every song. I'm like, hey, God, damn, I wish I'd written that. That's so good. <laughs> and that's the line in this song. That Thank just you so me. much. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, it was deliberate. I was I was really careful when I was writing the song to not, I didn't want it to be a love story. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure in some of the verses I cut out that there were more elements to that just because I think that's just, you know, uh, you know, you've written, like, you know, any songwriter, like, yeah, it, whatever. The, the, the easiest way to add depth to a song is to just say what you want to say and then add with you at the end. <laughs> you know, like, so... Uh, I was trying to avoid that, um, and I think I, I think I was I was happy with how it was avoided. You know, I, it, it, I'm talking to someone. I, I didn't, you know, it's not a girl, it's not a boy. It's just like a thing. It's yeah. whatever. Um, but when we started talking about the video and having a girl in the video, I wanted to reiterate that point because also I've, I've never had a video with a girl in it, and like, yeah, I think it'd be really easy to draw that conclusion. Is that okay? It's a you know, Jake's in the video, but girls in the video, whatever. It's it's a lot. So I was really trying to make sure that it was like, you know, because I I don't consider my I'm not Jake. You know, I I know I'm a really good actor in that video, <laughs> and clearly I, I'm all these people. But uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just like I'm G- haircut guy one, busker guy <laughs> one, whatever. I'm I'm not I'm not a part of the video. Yeah, I'm just the guy that was in it because I was saying it. You know, uh, so I was really careful to have it not be. A love story. You know, maybe it's a love story with moving away or something. But uh, I didn't want it to be like boy girl. Like come to Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. I miss you. You know. Yeah. That, that was, so I wanted to make sure the video also portrayed that. But that's what good songwriters do too, though, is they have universality about their songs that people can insert themselves into. Right. So yeah. If that yeah. resonates as a love song for someone, well, then great. That's awesome. If that's right. how you interpret it, brilliant. You know. Exactly. That's why I didn't want to stamp it on because yeah. You know, then there are people that it wouldn't resonate with. So I just wanted to yeah. make it, you know, however that home missing you is how you decide that it does, right? That's that's yeah. all in your head because it's a, you know, home is a a, a concept. So uh, absolutely, you know, I figured I want to leave that to them and not have it be, you know, so trite. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's keeping it alive is the second track on the album, and this is one that is funny again because when I went back and I was like, oh, did. The Dream was the is the oldest song out of this set of songs. But Keeping It Alive is the one that I think to me feels the closest to down the line era. Jake Thistle. Like, it's got similar bones. It's got a similar flow to it, some of those songs. Um, but I also noticed that because the the demo that you've got on YouTube, you pitched up, I think, right? Did you set you, you put you you pitched up a full step, I think, in the recording. Keeping it alive has had so many keys. Okay. Yeah. Adult, I wrote it. In C, I think. Okay. Finally, we landed in B flat for the record. Yeah. There's probably YouTube videos of me in A. I think it's, yeah, you're in A flat or something because you're capoed, right? Okay. Then, yeah, yeah. probably. Um, yeah. Especially in those early days when I, when I, you know, that kind of weird 2021, 2020 and 2021 are like weird years for my songwriting because like, down the line had come out. I didn't have a record contract. I didn't know what was coming. So yeah. like when I was putting up videos, I would just like haphazardly throw a capo on whatever fret and play <laughs> it in whatever position. And, you know, so I'm sure. Yeah, most of these songs uh, have seen a lot of key changes, um, especially Keeping It Alive. Keeping It Alive and The Dreamer. Okay. Which, which is funny because they were in the same session. But they also, they're the two oldest. Um, but Keeping It Alive has seen a lot of edits. I right. don't know all of them are even up on YouTube, but I'm sure you could find versions where there's a lot of different lyrics and replaced verses and things yeah. like that. 
I'd kind of sat on that song for a while. I did. So here's the question then for you, because again, I love asking people about that because I love process, right? The, the, the process of writing songs, that's what gets me off. But what, when do you know when you found the right key then? Is there something where you think, ah, my voice is right there or there's some harmonic thing that happens between the piano and the guitar or does the producer just say, I think your voice sounds better there? What's the usually the determining factor on that? Um, you know, for keeping it alive, now I'm trying to think. Okay. I wrote, I remember now, I wrote Keeping It Alive in G. Oh, okay. Um, a long, long time ago. And it probably had a different melody. And I remember specifically writing that song and I was starting it on, you know, the D, the five is kind of where the melody kind of swings back around in the yep. verse. And I was playing it like, in you know, as a C chord up to frets. Okay. With the open G ringing. So it was kind of like a sus. And I just thought that was like a cool sound. I hadn't really started a song on the five. I usually start them on the four. So I thought it'd be interesting and different. So that's how I wrote the song. You know, at least the chords for the song. Yeah. And then I'm glad you asked that about this song because I, I wouldn't be able to, I don't know why I remember this so well. <laughs> it's probably the only one I could tell you exactly what I was thinking. But, uh, yeah. you know, I just, I was writing it and, you know, after a D, okay, and you go to the E minor, whatever. And then I started writing the lyrics. And then at some point I just decided, all right, the key has to change. It needs to sound better or whatever. Right. Uh, and so because I was younger, I think I moved it to C because that's just where it fit nicely in my voice. And then three years passed and, you know, I, I wasn't 15, I was 18, <laughs> whatever. And then B flat made the most sense. Um, yeah. So that that's probably how it happened. But uh, in general, it, you know, I just write and I, I don't, I really don't know. I, I usually start, with the with the chords okay and then from the chords i'll pick up a melody so really i i just whatever chords i have picked i f just fit a melody in that <laughs> you know so like if i decide capo 3 c you know e flat works for me yeah then i'm just going to sing a melody that sounds good at e flat because I'm, i've already been writing an e flat and then when it's done if i say you know what i could really blow this out and just make it huge maybe i'll move it to f Right. Or something. Or vice versa. Like when we did Brooklyn Can Wait, I wrote that song in E flat. Um, okay. And the and then the, now the record version is in C sharp or D flat. So I was writing it in E flat. And I think I still think it sounds really good, but because it was higher in my voice, it was a little poppy and bubbly and yeah. that worked with the piano demo because it was kind of swung and bouncy and anything. But when I started tuning my guitar down and playing it in open tuning with with just downbeats and, you know, straight eighths, yeah. I decided a little bit darker worked. So I moved it to D, you know, which is a half step. Yeah. And then when I realized, because D, D flat is too low. Um, right. Still, like when I play it live, I do it in D. But I knew in the studio, the way we record the vocals, I could really lock in. It's just that... With it's yeah, that, that it's low, man. It's and it's hard. It's to, pretty low. It's hard to control that when you because people don't know that it's it's easy to push air at the top end of your range because it's yeah. easy to control that when you're down at that it's it's harder to get that to sound good. Yeah, totally. So yeah, so when I was in the studio, I realized we can control that a little more. I can do it a thousand times till I get it right. Yeah, and also I can sing it as low as I you know as um volume wise as quiet as I want. Yeah, and they can just pump it full of compression and gain and, and get it to where it needed to. Tyler's yeah. a great producer. He'll figure it out. That was kind of my thought. <laughs> I said, let me just lower one more key because then I can keep it kind of dense and dark, which is what I wanted to, you know? Yeah. But in, yeah, so keeping it alive, I, but the other thing I've noted was there's a really nice turnaround. There's a push in the turnaround coming out of the second chorus and into that next verse with the piano, bass and drums that's not there. And again, it's not there in the demo. So that's again, you know, when you listen back to those demos and I'm always like, that's not there. He didn't have that there. So I always kind of think, I wonder if that was just spontaneous in the studio or whether that was worked up. But then it's also, we get that drop out of the drums in the last verse and there's some slide guitar in there. And I was curious, did you play that slide guitar part? I did. Or was that your... Yeah. Oh, I, nice. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, that was planned, that turnaround. I, okay. original, original demo, everything was going back to one. 
you know so the yeah. intro just like four bars of one and then you know yeah i'm keeping it alive right on the resolution one and whatever i just didn't i thought it it was i didn't think it was me because I suppose it's like petty, but like I, I'm not a big fan of ending on the one or starting yeah. on the one. Like I love a good four chord. So uh, <laughs> I just, I, I started sitting at the piano and, and saying, all right, what can I do with this? And eventually I kind of came onto that four, five, four, five, four, five thing. And I, you know, in addition, there was no bridge in the original uh, okay. song. I don't know if you heard that in the, de- I don't know how old that demo was, but I'm sure there's versions. It was just, two more verses that I ended okay. And so when I wrote that bridge, which is just kind of like rewrite to the first and second verse, like set a little bit of a different way. It's, it's, it's six, five, one, four. And I thought if I take <laughs> out the one of the intro and the turnarounds, it makes it really interesting yeah. that the only one in the entire song is a passing chord in the bridge. <laughs> I just thought uh-huh. like, that's really weird. So yeah. in my and it ended up working. So, yeah. And then the lap steel. That's a um, that's a Duesenberg lap steel. Oh, um, nice. That has the benders on it. I I nice. was Ron Blair has one, and I was um, playing with him uh, in L.A. And he was like showing me a little bit of, on it, and I was saying like, oh yeah, I don't know how to play lap steel. So, and I mean, it's a Duesenberg, right? So it's not cheap. Uh, yeah. And so I said, I'll probably get like you know one of those two hundred dollar lap steels and like learn. It. And he goes, no. Don't do that because you're going to get the $200 lap steel, learn it, and then you're going to buy this anyway. So if you're worried about, I don't remember how much, it, it, I, I got a really good deal on it. But like typically, you know, he's like, he just said, you know, would you rather spend $2,000 or $2,000 and $200? You know, just buy yeah. the next and learn on that because you're going to want it anyway. So I took his advice and uh, <laughs> yeah, we brought it to the studio and and uh, and, and that was cool. I would, every time I, I'm better at lap steel now than I was then. But other than that, you know, but I a, think mixed in really cool. It's a great instrument. I've got if my 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 best friend who does all the music for this podcast, he sits there when he plays lap steel or he plays just to play his lap acoustic or slide acoustics. Like, and I, there's just something about that sound. Absolutely, that I, dig, I dig. We're talking about song structure then and, and mess around. And that's the stuff that I think it's cool for us. For, for if you're a musician here, you think I see what he's done there. That's really clever. But for non, if you've not got that music clear, there's still something about that song. Then that's interested. You know, you don't know what it is. And you couldn't articulate what it is, but it's not just that straightforward. And Brain Freeze is another one that I thought has a really cool structure because you kind of mess it around. You don't know where four is ever really in that song. And it's in, I think it's in two, four rather than four, four. You know, it's, you it's this, better than me. <laughs> it's, it's this weird sort of, it's, it's, it's an odd one. It's an odd, and, and it was yeah. one of the ones where I thought straight away, like, I like this song. This is another one that was like, I get what this is. I'm totally on board with this. It's a really strong piece of writing. I loved it in Silky Man. Thank you. Yeah, that song, it, it's funny with that song. It, j- in general, I write a lot of bars of two. Uh, right. I did it on Down the Line because I didn't know how music worked and I didn't know how to count. And like I just wrote, <laughs> and I played to a click, but it wasn't like a four click. It was just like, you know, so <laughs> right. uh, whatever. And I didn't realize. But then as I started to get older and I understood that, I found myself not wanting to avoid it because it, it's just now that's how I sound and I really like it. I think it's interesting. So I yeah. still write like that. I just understand that I'm doing it a little better. Um, uh, and so with brain freeze, it was really funny because in addition to that, there's, we, we did, there's two drummers face. I mean, it's this, it's Tyler both times, but right. You know, I wanted uh, the train track brushes, um, but we did it. Like that, and this isn't even in the studio. This is just we played it. I played it live with my band a whole bunch before we'd gone in because now I've okay. had the band for a while and, and I was taking it out places. And I just was getting so bored. Uh, it's not a short song, but I remember just thinking, like, all right, like I'm, I'm kind of over it. And I didn't think that was obviously that's not a good thing to be thinking about the song yeah. you're going to have you as your next single. Uh, <laughs> so I had him uh, uh, doing like you know, uh, uh, you know, the brushes. And then he came back in and just did like a big Tom thing. Yeah. You know, one and two, two, um, you know, you're, you're a drummer, you know, better than me, yeah. but, um, you know what he's doing uh, yeah. and he knows what he's doing and that's all that matters. And, uh, <laughs> so I think that kind of trends into the craziness of that track. It is a little cacophonous, but I like it. But it, 
again, I think it's because it's, and I think, like I said, I think it's 2 4. I mean, 2 4 and 4 4 really is 6 1 after the Zither, obviously, but I think because it's got that to it, it moves around a lot. Like it's, it's yeah. wrestling, it's a wrestler song, or it doesn't sit in any one place. Like I said, that's where you can't really count four bars in it very easily because it yeah. because of that because you're not going by you're not resolving down to the root on the one or the four every time like it's this thing that's it's fluid and again it just makes it really really interesting um and again you know i'm fading by degrees just another great line they just seem to fall out of you it's frustrating because well i stole that <laughs> where's that from that's from saving grace. oh of course saving grace good grief but here's the funny oh, God, thing. here's the funny thing i've always liked that line but you know i'm not a big fan I don't like to steal entire lines. Yeah. You know, I steal ideas. I steal lines from books because it's like, no one will find that. It's in 200 pages, but you know, in a song, whatever. But then the Lumineers put out an album uh, and I know they opened for Tom a couple of times, I think. And, and they put out a cover of Walls and stuff. So I know they're petty fans. Yeah. And they had, uh, I forget what the song was now, but they have a line fading by degrees. And I hadn't really heard of that other than in Tom's song. Yeah. Um, and so I just felt like, oh, well, hell, if they're going to take it, I'm going to take it. So I stole it from Tom, but kind of with- Why the Lumineers? The Lumineers <laughs> broke the ice, and they took it first. <laughs> so uh, that's how that worked out. But, it's, amazing uh, that, it's amazing that I've never- I don't know how I never caught that. That's Because Saving Grace is- I mean, mm-hmm. I've talked about that song lots with people I have on the episodes, and it's like, why did I never notice that? But I have a question on, so I don't like the way you- What's the next word? Is it leave? And then it's not what I mean when you sing that piece. It's almost oh, like uh, a call and response. Yeah. I don't. So oh, it's uh, it's uh, I can see every word I say. Yeah. As it fogs up the cold from my mouth. Yeah. Uh, but I don't like the way it reads. It reads okay. I thought I couldn't quite get the, and I even I, I threw it into Fader to take the stems out to see if I get the vocal yeah. isolated. I still couldn't quite hear it, but cool. But I like that bit too because that again, it's got almost that call and response thing to it. Just the way your your dynamics are on the vocal. So again, all, all those little production choices, again, I mean, you know, as a, somebody who sort of sits and overanalyzes songs, I'm always looking for that attention to detail, and there's lots of it in that song. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think part of the reason it moves around so much is because I'm in a really weird tuning. And right. it, when I wrote it, at least, it wasn't a tuning I was super familiar with. So I was just kind of like strumming really fast and trying to put, you know, the yeah. reason I wrote the song is the tuning, uh, it's open A, but it's kind of an inverted open A. Uh, and... Uh, so it's what is it? It's E A. Oh crap! Let me look at the piano. It's <laughs> it's E A C sharp E A. No. <laughs> e A C sharp E A C sharp. Morning old. And that's the tuning. At, that could be wrong, but that's the tuning that Dylan uses on the original uh, acoustic version of One Too Many Mornings. Um, Didn't know that. And he capos it third fret C. And so I was I was playing that song and I wanted to take it live. You know, I'd play it out live. But it's not a tuning you can just slide into. You know, open G, you just drop two strings and you're fine. Yeah. Um, but that, but I couldn't justify bringing out a guitar tune like that for one song. Right. Uh, so I just wrote a song in that tuning. So that's how that happened. Right, that's fun. You know, because everyone, you know, crowds up and down the world, all over the world, love waiting for the guitarist to tune their damn guitar, right? You know, there's nothing better than watching someone tune up for 15 minutes, like, right? Just have an extra guitar there. It's fine. Yeah. You've, got, you've got 50. We all know guitars, all 50 guitars, just bring an extra one. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I figured if I'd get, if I could bank two songs. Yeah. Ironically, I, after that, I've never played the Dylan song again. <laughs> so now I'm just bringing it one for one song again. But oh well. Well, that's where people. And it's, that's where, you know, when you adapt songs live quite often, then people will just change, you know, the, the, the position of the chords or they'll change the phrasing a little bit. And it, and it changes the, you know, because sometimes when you hear a song live, you think there's something about that that doesn't sound quite the same as it does on the album. Yeah. And because it's not a capo or it's not, there's some kind of different, they're using different positions in the chord. So, yeah, sometimes I play it like when I have to, I play it um, uh, capo fourth fret in G standard. Okay. But it just doesn't, it's not the same. Yeah. There's something about the way the, the strings ring in that weird tuning, because it's like not, it rings like an open D tuning, which I use a lot, but it's a, it's just, they're different intervals. So it, it yeah. sounds weird and I like it. You know, it's good for that yeah. song. Um, 
I got to maybe I got to write another one in that tuning so I can break so it you out. Break it out. <laughs> <laughs> Gives it its own personality, though, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Ghosted Road, like I said, I mean, obviously when that came out, I think December sixteenth, twenty twenty two, right, was when that came out. Yeah. yeah. But that's the big, like I said, that's if if Jake's Jake Thistle's going into the studio, that's kind of what I'm waiting for to come out the other end, and that's what I'm hoping for, and that's what we got. And it said like digging into that song, the drums on that record. I mean, the whole record, the drums on this are great, but the drums on Ghosted Road, I just love. They sound fantastic. That snare sounds great. There's great definition in the low end with the kick and everything. So I was a big fan of just how that song sounds. But you told me that, um, when I sort of asked you about that, that Ghosted Road, that phrase was the last part of that song that fell into place, right? You kind of had everything else, but you couldn't quite. I'm just a lonely soul. (laughs) It's Hey Indiana Girl, right? You know, it just doesn't work. I need something different. Or is you, you rock me. No, it's not good enough. I need something else. Exactly. It didn't say anything. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? You're sad sack? That's, uh, that's nothing new in my songs. Every song is just, yeah, I'm a sad sack. <laughs> so I wanted to just say something a little different. And, um, you know, everything else talked about the roads. So yeah. I think, like, it's it's got to be something like that. I mean, you know, I, I and that's just what kind of came out. I don't, Yeah. I still don't necessarily know what it means, but no, I, I think it works. I think it's an image. For sure. And, it, you, and that is something that you you know, deliberately or intuitively have is that ability to write visually, sort of cinematically. You give us sort of pictures like, again, like Tom did, right? You've got these things where you can say, I see something when I listen to this. Like when I, live, when I listen to Love is a Long Road, I just see the Pacific Coast Highway, right? You just yeah. see a top down. Yeah. That's, you just see that in your head. And Ghosted yeah. Road, you get this, I, I get sort of, I get back streets. I get sort of, you know, upstate New York or I get... Vermont or, or some like those big, big pine trees and all this kind of stuff. So I've got that visual. But again, I mean, the line, another line in this song, your tears meant nothing next to what your silence said. What? My God, how do you write this at 17, 18? It's ridiculous. Because it's like, I've written down three words. It's negation, ending, finality is what it is. It's it's sort of the end. You know, once you get to that point, then it's done. It's over at that point, right? So Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't take credit for that song because I wrote it on... Um... The 64 Tysco that Campbell sent me. Okay. I, I think it was just the mojo from the guitar. Like, I can't take it. <laughs> not my hand that wrote that song. That was like, I don't know, like, whatever yeah. Mike played on that in 1972 that no one remembers. You know, he can't. <laughs> that's what wrote that song. It's just there with that guitar and mojo. That's that's that that's what I'll plead. <laughs> I, I've talked to people about that before, too, because there's, you know, the, the famous piano at Abbey Road where that Let It Be was played on, and then a million songs have been played on that. I think that when you sit down with an instrument like that or, or behind the keyboard or something like that, I don't, there's no, I'm not a believer in sort of, you know, spirits and those kind of things, but there's something about that though that's going to change your responsibility to the instrument maybe, right? Where you think, well, Mike Campbell gave me this guitar and I didn't make good use of it then. So maybe I'll lock in a little bit further than I would ordinarily. That's where I always kind of take an angle on that, you know? I don't think it's yeah. coming out of the guitar. I think you're putting into the guitar what you think it needs. Well, thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you putting the glory back. <laughs> you wrote a song, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and I said, like, you know, the, the the stay, the big the big punch on stay, and then when you don't do it in the last chorus, again, it's just a wonderful bit of a range, and it just keeps that song moving along because too many songs just keep going. You know, the the chorus is sung exactly the same way. This is the way the verse is sung. I do another podcast with a friend on. Uh, we, we just finished covering ninety zero Metallica. Oh, wow. you, Metallica do a lot of the same thing over and over and over again. And there's not as much movement. So I always like it when, again, always the Tom Petty project, they don't feel bad about keep bringing him up, but that's what Tom and Mike always did a good job of is just changing. It's just that little melody line or they'll drop this out or they'll put a suspended chord in there or something just to change it just that little bit. And those mm-hmm. little things in, in this song again, just sort of, they make me happy. You know? so, Thank, yeah, I, I try to be really careful. I don't like to fly anything in, uh, in the yeah. studio. You know, uh, I think there's a lot of merit to the, the folks that'll, you know, sing a chorus and then they just copy paste it three times. I think there's a time and a place to do that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't like doing that, uh, especially on a song like Ghosted Road, just because it's that that is kind of a, a bar band song anyway. Right. Um, you know, like it could have uh, we didn't do it on Brooklyn Can Wait, but like it could have worked a little more on that song, you know, because that's a little bit more of a factory, you know, in terms of how the vocals are produced and stuff. Right. I think it road called for a little bit more of a rawness and, you know, maybe I'm a little sharp here, a little flat there, whatever. I, I think it kind of fit the song. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Heartbeats, nothing. All it's right. Kind 
it reminds me a little bit just in sort of i don't know in spirits of time to move on and i think it's maybe just it's the tempo it's not quite a shuffle but it has a little of that and it's got that big ethereal again it doesn't resolve down to the root always exactly where you expect it to be and it's a big arrangement on this one yeah this is my favorite one on the record okay uh, i don't know why but uh that's always the joke I make uh, with my label is because they know, you know, my taste in like Tom Petty and Springsteen and everything. And they know that I always like the deep cuts. So it doesn't surprise me that this was not offered up as a single at any point. <laughs> but it's it's my favorite. I don't know. I, I, I really like it. And I appreciate that comparison. Um, this is another one that saw a lot of different arrangements, uh, especially in, in the strumming pattern and the speed. It used to be pretty slow. Okay. and. I'm trying to like equate it to another song, but it it it, it was sort of uh, that type of like almost like a you're so bad strumming pattern, but slow, really slow, yeah. just kind of trudge it, you know. Um, and and so uh, at some point we were getting ready to bring it into the studio. I I just thought, all right, let me let me see if I can really take this up a notch and just play it as fast as I can with a busy strumming pattern, and and that way I think it allowed the rest of the arrangement to sort of just sit on like the clouds, you know, like, like those, right. those organs and synthesizers, the guitar is really, I, I mean, we added the drums in too, but the, the guitar is really the thing that that's driving the song. So there, there doesn't need to be a big piano line that that's like, you know, fully on all yep. the things. It can just kind of sit and like, kind of like the intro to crawling back to you. I, I'm trying to equate it to Tom Petty project thinks as well, you that's know, uh, you know how everything can kind of just float on top of that one root. Yeah. Well, it's again, it you know the, the the danger going into the studio sometimes is well we've got a full studio we can add sixty four tracks. Well, you don't you know it, Betty it was always good at like take as much out as you can basically and still have the song be really really good, but don't leave things in just because you can. Right. Um, and I think the, the balance on this one is really good. I mean, the soul in this one. I mean, I've said you know uh, crawling back to you, time to move on. Sorry with the tempo, but the soul's very boys of summer to me, and it's got that similar tone it's got a ton of echo on it or a delay on it um and they're not like it's not a big flowing solo they're short phrases so did thank you was that was that you as well did you play the that solo? was me yeah oh, yeah it's a, it's a good solo man i really really like thank you song. so much i appreciate that was sort of a uh just from a gear standpoint a wake-up call that solo because you know we're sitting in this that was the last thing we did um okay what was the solo we had had the whole song was done and we were listening back I didn't know what really to put there. You know, part of me wanted to put like kind of like a Wilco type, just like, let's just have the drums do whatever the hell they want. And like just right. big fills and like off beat and like have yeah. all these synthesizers like rise up to like a wrong chord or something. Like I really thought that would be cool and just kind of like, like grading in a good way. Um, and I think Tyler had the good sense of saying, let's not do that <laughs> um, to an otherwise pretty predictable song. Uh, and so there's some, I think there's some place for that in some of the new songs I'm writing. But um, yeah, so we ended up doing a solo, but we're sitting in the studio with, I mean, Lake House Studio in Asbury Park is is um, really an incredible space and they have so much gear. They have just walls of amps and everything. And we just yeah. did plug directly into Logic. Okay. Um, and just with Logic, um, or I guess it was Pro Tools. Because the studio uses Pro Tools, but Tyler uses Live. It was one of those things, you know. Uh, <laughs> but we use like a preamp on the computer. On okay. A we and, and and like behind me are these like vintage Princetons and like like all this like 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 Mount Rushmore guitar gear. Yeah. Uh, and we said let's just keep it simple, and that way he can go home and you know work on it and change yep. whatever he wants. And and I, he mixed it really well, and and it, it's not in your face, but it it, it just kind of sits on everything. And so I'm really happy with the way we did it. And and I think it's a re- thank you. I appreciate. it. I think it's a cool solo too. Uh, it's it not fits. what we normally play. It uh, fits, so man. Like it's it's exactly the right part for the song, and that's the important thing, right? Anytime you're putting a song together, is it, there's nothing worse than you know. Say you have gone into a little like a slash type solo or something. They'd be like, yeah, it's good, but I don't know. Or or if you'd done that where you'd broken out into some sort of syncopated polyrhythm, or you've got it, it, I think it would have broken up the song, right? It's not right for the song. You need to serve the song, and you do it. You do it beautifully. Um, and quite, so I had a question too about the bass on this one. Is that a fretless bass on this song? No. Okay, um, isn't it? Because there's a couple of just a couple of little slides. Was like, 
And I'd love to hear that isolated because it's it's really got a it's got that Tony Levin thing almost. I was like, no, Thank you. that's fretless. I appreciate it. that. Was uh, I played the bass too, so I really appreciate oh, cool. that, that compliment because I I don't consider myself a bass player by any means. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that bass. I think it was just a uh, like a Fender P bass. I, I don't think it was anything okay. special. Might have been a Rickenbacker, but I think it was a Fender P bass. It, I remember on on the Brooklyn Can Wait session, which was again like that. Brain freeze and happy something was just me and Tyler in the studio. Yeah, and for Brooklyn can wait. We spent like an hour testing out different bases. Like, yeah, I played it four times on the Rick and four times on the Fender and four times on a Gretsch and like we we a hop <laughs> I try and like yeah. I, I don't remember even what we landed on. So when we went in for this session, which we did happy something and brain freeze at the same time, we kind of walked into it remembering what we learned last time and and it took a lot quicker. But I think yeah, I yeah. Uh, Brain Freeze was a Rickenbacker, I think. And okay. Half Beats Nothing was a P bass. Yeah, I mean, really, you, you can use a Rickenbacker. You use all these, but you really only need a P bass. You only need a Fender, really. A Fender will do everything you need it to do. Right. So, well, you... <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, it's just the most versatile, one of the most versatile guitars ever made, right? Really. Which is the reason yeah. why I'm still using them. Um, yeah, and again, some great lines in this song I'd written down. You know, it's much easier to start than it is to try again. Thank and it applies you. to so many aspects of life, right? Relationships, songwriting. And it's funny because I, I'm a, my trade by trade, I'm a, a programmer. So Me? every programmer, you don't want to fix someone else's code. You don't want to sort of work on something. You just, just, just do it again, right? So it's yeah. that sort of that tendency that we, we'd we rather chase something new than try and make the familiar better or, or keep it working, right? So that's I think that line captures that sentiment just beautifully. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just I just sort of had an image of that. And really, I I don't know if I meant it at the time, but I think this song is sort of a rewrite of a, a song from down the line uh, okay. called "Trying Again," and and that was a, that was like one of the oldest songs that I had on down the line. It was uh, I wrote it when I was like thirteen or something like that. There's a couple songs <laughs> I listen to. I'm, I'm not that I'm sitting around listening to any of my songs, but like you know that'll come on when I'm trying to make a set list for something with the band or something and i'm like listening to pick songs and i, I wonder how that snuck onto the record so, you know, <laughs> that i can look at it almost five years later yeah uh, four years you know four years later but uh and i think that's what i was trying to say and trying again right um but i don't know if i i didn't think i really got there but i, I was kind of had in mind the same guy and like just the guy that decided, you know, it was easier to pick up and move states than it was to like make a bunch of apologies and where he's living now. Yeah. You know? Couch is and life ain't giving back the time it steals is the other line I love in there. Cause you know, I'm 50 and I feel that every freaking day, man, let me tell you, <laughs> time is not my friend anymore. I've got way more behind me than I've got ahead of me. So, <laughs> well, I pre, yeah, yeah, that, that line I was trying to, that line I sat on for a really long time. I forget what song that was originally in, but it just didn't fit. It might have been Rolling Away. Um, okay. I'm not sure. But whatever it was, it, it just, I knew that the line was good. I just couldn't figure out where to put it, you know? And so finally it kind of sat in nicely. Well, that's where, you know, again, people who don't write songs don't know that we, we cannibalize. You know, oh, we yeah. Say, okay, I, I can't use that verse, but that line, I know I'm going to use that eventually. So. I don't think I've written an, a newer song in like five or six years. <laughs> it's like a sourdough starter, you know, like people... People that like have them from like the 1700s or whatever. Like that's all of my songs are just things I've cut two years ago that I can figure out how to use now. Yeah. You know? It's nice though when you go, because you know, you, we talked a little bit earlier about wildflowers and things. When you're in that prolific sort of space, keep writing, man, because you never know when you're going to need it and when you're going to use it. But right. this song, I mean, it's that's cool that this is your favorite song now because it was one that it took a little while. This was a, a grower for me. This was one that I wasn't, wasn't sure about on first listen. But the more of it, it's one of those where every time I listen to it, it gets that little bit better. And I notice something else again, because there's lots of corners to look around in this song. It's not it's not as simple as it's as you make it sound, right? There's lots of stuff going on in there. It's just subtle. So I like I Thanks. like list I like listening to it and thinking, really noticed that before. And again, people, if you listen to this, please listen to these songs on the headphones. Listen to all songs on the headphones as well as on your stereo, because you learn so much more. Yeah, that was mixed by Tyler as well. Okay. Um, he's nothing and and you know, he's really good at figuring out how to make it sound cool you know yeah. um and he's a lot of the mind behind those and uh, there's something in the song that he put typically i would just send him a demo i would do a demo send him stems and then he would add some stuff and we'd kind of find something and then just redo it in the studio yeah and one thing it's something in the second verse 
there's like a little bit of a, a synth climb, like a very breathy synth. Yeah. And I just love how that sits there. That's all him. So I, I appreciate that, you know? Yeah. It's great, eh? When you give someone a song and it comes back and it's better. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. Tom oh, always yeah. saying, you know, give, we give a song to Ben Mon, it always comes back better. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um. So The Dreamer, you said like, that's, so that's the oldest song then that's we think you know, it's been around because I was looking, yeah, March 2021 I found. Um, along, <laughs> that was just you playing it on piano, I think. But I like the this where it ended up because you've got this rope up that you do that it's like, okay, well, it's this stripped back digital piano and you don't see that Actually, build. Ah. Into the, it's not digital. No, but everyone thinks that. I think that's just how it was mixed. We did oh. that on like a nine foot grand. Really? But it, it, it was mixed very compressed. Yeah, and I mean, there's, yeah, that... I would, I would never have. If I hadn't spoken to you, if someone else had told me, no, that's a real idea. I get out. No, that's digital, definitely. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, that that song is cool. The the mix of that is cool. That was, um, it, I, I think it's different than a lot of the other mixes that we have on the record. That was Very, a mix. Yeah. By David Bendith, who has a a pretty incredible, you know, discography of his own. You know, he's he's been around, you know, so many. I mean, he's incredible in and of himself. But yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's a very compressed song. I, I think it kind of fits the song, but. But yeah, that that piano, that's a, it's a really special, great piano they have there. Like I, I don't remember what it is. Like I think I guess it's a Steinway or something like that. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's it's a really great piano. Um, I'm trying to think of same piano as Keeping It Alive, but he mixed that too. So that might they might send some. I'm trying to think of another record uh, that it was on, but I'm, I'm sure I'll get there. But you know, yeah. But it's got that anyway. You know, it's it's one with a big. I'd say, you know, again, back to your influences, because they, they do filter through. It's, it always sounds like Jake Thistle first and foremost, but this is a Jackson Brown chord progression to me. This one's like, yeah, I could I could see Jackson covering this one. I could see him doing a good job of this one live. It would it would suit him. He would like this one, you know. Thank you. Um, and again, the pause in the beat doesn't come exactly where you're expected in this, where you cut there, where the drums cut out, because it's on the it's on the four, but it's slightly behind the beat as well. It's a bugger, because I'm trying to count it. like, is it on the three, Ander? <laughs> no, I think it's on the four, but I can't quite hear it. It's really, really cool. It's a fun way to move the song along again, right? Like, it's just, Thank again, you. I'm just a huge nerd to those little things, so. I appreciate it. Yeah, that song was a blast. That You know, that's when we had the full band in there, and mm -hmm. it, that was cool, too, because I worked with them on Ghosted Road in July of 22, and I hadn't I hadn't seen or talked to any of them uh, in until we did this, which was December. So it was really nice to kind of catch up with them and give them a couple new songs and, yeah. you know... Um, because, you know, since then, after I worked with them on that, I started bringing them out, you know, and doing some more full band original gigs and things like that, um, which is, kind of, I guess, primarily what I do these days. Although I do a lot of acoustic stuff, too. But uh, that was cool because that was like a big catch up. You know, we did uh, we did a couple of rehearsals, but it was cool to just kind of see what they were up to and thinking yeah. about with the song because they hadn't heard anything in between. Whereas now, if we were to go in the studio, they've heard a ton of other songs that they hadn't played on. You know, but this was kind of like just like a second try, you know. Yeah, man, the harmonies in this song, the so I mean, the production on the they, they soars above everything else. The harmonies in the chorus, and I think they're they're so beautifully captured and so nicely mixed. And then the solo is almost like this this mandolin style, but I'm assuming that was played on electric guitar. But it's yeah, got that's kind of. And then we yeah yeah that was really cool. That was Nick Nella who uh, who's the okay. really great guitar player. I believe he also sang that harmony you're talking about okay i think that i don't remember if i did that or he did that but i think he did that and if so i think that's i think that's his only um harmony um I, he sang a lot in the studio but i'm trying to remember now yeah no he sang harmonies on keeping it alive too for sure but i i think that's probably his most prominent harmony is in the dreamer way oh keep an eye off you know that's yeah. him um and uh yeah, he did that solo, and and it was. We were trying to figure out what to put there. Um, I had been playing it on piano. Okay. Not like that, like, you know, just kind of like in a weird, like, kind of lead sheet way, where I was like placing the chord behind it and just doing stuff. Um, and so when he said, "Why don't we try it like this?" and he started doing it on guitar, it kind of like changed. Like all of us looked up and, and was like, "Oh shoot!" That so so from <laughs> there on, I went back and I just did it in four piano octaves just like my thumbs and pinkies just doing it and then we did um we brought out the glockenspiel um oh, okay and, uh, so yeah so it's pretty cool some layer another nice yeah and there, again i mean i was i want to talk to you about your lyrics 
I mean, this is maybe, you know, you're starting to forget who sung different vocals. This is why I think that every album we record, we'll have to do this because then in 20 years, I can write conversations with Jake Thistle and we'll have, <laughs> you know, contemporaneous memories that you'll be able to tell me exactly who played what. But hey, this, morning, me. <laughs> this morning, I uh, punched myself through the mirror on the wall. Now I'm picking up all the shattered pieces of me. And it goes back to, again, that cinematic ability that you have to sort of paint this. Because that's, that's obvious. That's a very obvious picture. It's very explicit. But then because you come back to it again, you revisit that line in the breakdown before that last chorus to tie all that, to tie that line back up together. And again, that's that thing of watching a songwriter grow and thinking, I don't know whether you would have done that four or five years ago where you sort of, you know, to, to pull that line and think, okay, well, that's a good, that's a good image. So I'll just drop that in here. It's not going to be exactly the same. I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm going to use the same idea. So that, t- that ties together. Very, very cool. That's, yeah. I, you know, that, that was one of the songs, uh, I yeah you know, I wrote it in January of twenty one so like that was the first song I wrote after down the line yeah um or the, at least the first good song I wrote after down the line um uh and uh it was like another six and a half minute or you know like there was a ton of different lyrics and and uh, mirror on the wall was there I think from the beginning okay but uh that the bridge was that that call back to it I had. The way it was structured, it was like it was like a verse, bridge, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus. Although it wasn't the bridge when I wrote it, but after I trimmed all that out, I just <laughs> made it bridge. Yeah. Um, and I forget I, we would have to look at that March demo you were talking about, but uh, I, you know, the I don't know where you are. Seems if you left my reflection, there was definitely some other line there that I didn't. Okay. I guess I I didn't gravitate toward as much. Um, and, and that's why it and I ended up calling back to the mirror. But that then this that writing was must have been in twenty three, you know. Right. Because uh, after we did Ghosted Road Rolling Away, which were fairly new songs, uh I decided instead of writing new songs for Joe and the label, to go back and see because I figured this is like this is a new moment of my career. And if I don't at least look back for a little bit, I'm going to lose everything I've done between down the line and now. Because yeah. I just started writing. So I went back and that's where I pulled Keeping It Alive and, and The Dreamer. Yeah. Uh, there were other songs in there that I, that I've just been lost. You know, I still have them. Sometimes they, they pop in my head. But <laughs> for the most part, those are the two that I thought should be brought back and, and reevaluated. And then yeah. when it says that, then I wrote that I actually wrote the next three, you know, for the record. Okay, well, let's go to the album Closer Roll in a way. Like I said, this is right. another one that has become one of my favorite tracks on the album. For that, in, I, can't, I wouldn't really be able to articulate why, but it's the feel of it. There's just something about the, the way it feels. And again, when I start thinking back to Brooklyn Can Wait and consider them as two sort of, you know, the yin and yang, the two halves of the coin, it's just you couldn't finish it. You couldn't close this album with any other song on it, for sure. And I don't know how you would write something that fits better. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. This I always had the idea that this would be the closer. And I, I actually, this is one of the rare songs that I didn't want to be dynamic. I thought, you know, it's short enough. Yeah. And then we, we sped it up a lot. And, and now it's under three minutes, which is yeah. very rare for me. And I think the only song I've ever put out that's under three minutes. Um, and uh, I just didn't think it needed to have all this, like, you know, like the dreamer is so like yeah. the bridge, there's no drums. And, you know, um, even even like I, I feel like a lot of the other songs have that similar structure of like, we didn't start out with drums and now we have it. Oh, and then that, the bridge, there's no drums. And then we're back with drums, you know? Yeah. Uh, so for this song, I thought we let's just keep it all at like 60% the whole time and kind of close out on just like a kind of a stagnant, interesting thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was kind of my where my mind was for the re-recording of it. And it's the only song that doesn't have drums. Yeah. Those are all MIDI, uh, you know, logic stuff. Yeah. Just because of where we recorded it, we they, we didn't have drums there. Um, well, it doesn't need it either, though, right? Like like you said, I mean, yeah. if you're going for that vibe, if you if you threw acoustic drums in, there, I mean, obviously you can mix them, make them sound different ways, or trigger them, or whatever. But you'd lose. I think that's that indescribable thing that I love. You'd lose it if you overegged it, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think the guitar sounds interesting on it too. It was really funny because I had played a Martin on everything on the record except okay. for. Ghosted, uh, no, except for um, Brooklyn Can Wait, I used a Gibson. Um, but everything else was 
either my CEO, I don't have them in here. I guess I would have brought them out, but <laughs> my CEO seven, uh, you know, which is like that smaller Martin or yeah. the 74 D 35 that have been playing a lot. Um, so for this one, when I went down, I didn't go down with a guitar cause they have plenty. Uh, and Jake had said, he said it just would be an interesting sound. I, I didn't hear it until we thought about it. Cause I love Martin. I'm, I'm attached to Martin. I don't like not playing Martin. Um, and he had a Martin there. So I said, we're just going to do that. But, uh, he said, let's try a Taylor, which I don't really like. Right. Mix like a Martin. And he thought it would sound cool. And so that's what we did. He, he cued it like a Martin, but it was a Taylor. And I think it's a, it's, it's an interesting sound. It's a little bit of a sharper sound. Yeah. It's bright is not exactly the right word, is it? But I know what you mean is it's got a different, man, I'm struggling to, it, it's more, not metallic's not the right word either. Cause they're simply strings, but. There is a different tone to it, definitely. Yeah. When you, especially if you know what a Martin sounds like, and a Martin just sounds like a Martin. But um, again, I'm going to jump back into lyrics again with you, Jake. So, and this clown car holds one, and I'm that lonely soul. Again, you sort of, you have this, again, another sort of. I had to put another, lonely soul somewhere. <laughs> I took it out of Ghost Road and I put it there. But it's not, it works there because it's not cliche because you've got that clown car thing. And I think then that pair, that pair of sort of ideas, works really well and you don't you don't fall back on cliche that's sort of one of the things i like about it because how careful are you about that like do you do is that something you look and think you've already said like you know you don't want to use long soul and all these kinds of things but how naturally does that come do you do a lot of editing after and think shit i've done it again or have you got to a stage now when you're writing where you know how to avoid the pothole before it comes up on the road well i think it's my biggest fault as a writer is i i will if if i feel a cliche coming i just stop writing the song um, okay. It's pretty like, you know, it's funny. I forget who I was talking to about this, but um, I'm not, I mean, at this point in my career, I, you know, which is, I'm, I'm still very early on. Yeah. You know, like if I drop dead tomorrow, you couldn't do uh, half left out and all the rest like they did with wild. <laughs> right. Because what I write is what I put out. Uh, I don't have another album of stuff I cut. You know, there right. are obviously every release there are three or four songs that didn't make it that could have but uh for the most part the songs i finish are the songs i take to the label and bring out and if i'm writing a song and i'm just if i'm a verse in three verses in, it doesn't matter how far if i'm not feeling it or i've come to a point where i want to say you know some sort of cliche i i tend to just stop and start writing a different song and then three months later i'll, I'll pull a line from that and kind of yeah. revitalize it uh so I'm, I guess the answer is yes, I'm very careful of it, but it's not something I've learned to avoid. It's just, I avoid it by not doing it, but I think that's <laughs> kind of an immature response that I'm hoping to get out of at some point. Well, I think though, I mean, that's just, maybe that's just your style of writing, right? I mean, it's not like, it's not like you haven't got seven fantastic songs on this record. So it's not like you've I, obviously, you obviously haven't walked away from Wildflowers or, you know, you don't know how it feels. So I don't, I always sort of think that you sort of writers should probably trust their instincts. Like as soon as you've got your own identity, which you already have, you've established that already. That if it's working, don't mess around too much with it because you might find that it tips the balance the other way. You know? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I suppose. I'm trying. You know, I feel like even in the worst song, there's at least some, one interesting idea I can take later. So yeah. I'm trying to see them through a little bit more because maybe I get two ideas out of it instead of one. Yeah. Um, but I do not like writing a song that I don't like. Yeah. I it's, hate it. Yes. I hate yeah. it. There's nothing worse though, too, eh? Going back through your memos and your notes and thinking, you know, you, you record something to your phone, and you think, what the hell was I thinking? That's awful, right? I don't know why. That's, that's oh, the oh, other oh. bad part. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I'll write a song and and you know, I, here I'm saying I only finish a song if I think it's a good song, but like I, the notebooks right here, I could just pull up a random page. <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? I, <laughs> and this is the song I finished, you know? Or what's worse sometimes is. Oh shit! That's let it be. I've just rewritten let it be subconsciously. Oh, Ross, I can't use that then. <laughs> so, right, exactly. But I love too the, the the way that, as I said, as a closer, picking the right song for the closer. And one of the other things I love about this, it doesn't finish on the root, so you leave it on that. I don't know if it's, yeah. it's, it's the fourth or something. So it, it's almost like it's leaving the album open to a sequel, which I think is super super cool. And again, what I'd said to you with Brooklyn can't wait and rolling the way being the bookends for this, in my head, in that in the sort of the cinema that you, that, that, that you created in my head. The Jake, one of the Jake characters, maybe, and the female character in Brooklyn Can Wait end up together. But this song then is sort of 10 years later when the relationships, 
maybe not in such a great, great place and they're trying to patch it back up. But as a listener, you think, I think you just need to, you need to roll away now. This, this is done. Yeah. You need to get away. So I think, like I said, visually for me, that's what really struck me when I listened, you know, because you listen, I've talked about this with people, but you listen passively just to enjoy music. When you're listening to write something interesting to ask, then you listen yeah. critically and that really hit me then. It's like, yeah, that really works as a, as a, as a narrative and to have that at both ends of the album, it's just chef's kiss. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. I was trying to just convey, like, I feel like the idea that people use, like, you know, when they say, we have, oh, we got time, it's fine, like, whatever. I feel like that's often used as an excuse to yeah. and not do it. Um, but I don't think that, that that's a, that's not insurance that you're going to. So yeah. I want to try to, you know, talk about that. Awesome. Well, you know, there's seven songs. It's a short album because we had 12 yeah, songs it's, on, it's, on it's, the uh, It's an awkward, um, you know, we planned it to be an EP. Yeah five songs or something like that. And then we just, I kept giving them stuff and we just said, all right, all right, whatever. So it's yeah. pretty funny because we exclusively refer to it as an EP, like in the Golden Retriever Records office. Yeah. But like Spotify and all those, they consider it an album. Yeah. So I'm glad we did it like that because, uh, you know, I had announced that I was going to be putting out an EP and seven songs is like a pleasant surprise. I, at least if you like the songs, it's pleasant. You yeah. know, it was like, oh, I, I thought it was going to be... Uh, an EP. This is like three more songs than I thought it would be. So I'm glad we did that instead of calling it a record and having it being half what a record should be. So, <laughs> right. you know, the next release will be a full release. Um, you know, we're 12 songs, something like that, you know. Well, let's talk about that, what's coming up then. So you've got a live album that's going to be coming. You just finished live recording at the Transparent Clinch Gallery. Did I get that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It had a beautiful space in Asbury Park. Uh, and uh, it, it was a blast. It, it was so much fun. That's going to be, I think, I mean, we're still working on the track list. We recorded 15 songs. Okay. Uh, we're going to probably put out 12. Um, so we're going to try and pick. Um, it's going to be all of the half left out, um, okay. probably in order. Um, and, you know, some of them are very similar. Some of them are pretty reimagined. Rolling Away, it's like this poor song has seen yet another version now. We did, uh, we did like a super stripped down um piano version super slow and quiet and, and i'm excited to to hear how that gets mixed and and yeah. that'll probably be the closer in this record too but uh so all of the half left out two songs from down the line and three unreleased songs oh cool uh that will be probably on the next project um, okay but it's interesting because it was just me and an accompanist who was gordon brown who's from a, a band called williams honor he is uh Really, I'm him and Reagan Richards who are in Williams Honor. They're, they're incredible musicians and very talented, and they've just they they've been around and done everything, you know. Um, and he is he's a great producer, great writer. Uh, so I was really thrilled to work with him. But it's it's pretty stripped down. It was mostly him on guitar, me on guitar or piano. Yeah. Um, and so it's cool. It's kind of a stripped down live album, but it's not. I mean, I guess it's acoustic, but it's not solo. Uh, so. It's an interesting, uh, I think it's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm really excited for how it's going to turn out. So what's the timeline for that? And what sort of formats? Is that going to be digital only? Or are you going to do CDs of that? Or uh, We're probably going to do a limited run of CDs. Everybody okay. who bought the ticket to the show uh, will get one. Um, so that um, the timeline for that, you know, I'm going in tomorrow to, to start mixing it, you know. Uh, so it's going to be great. I, you know, probably May. Uh, yeah. it is probably a realistic timeline that hedges my bets because I don't want to say April because it's now that I see the, the date it's almost April <laughs> well, I'll say May and we'll hope for the best but no mid-May is probably when we're doing it and it, I think it's a great way to kind of close out this era of Jake Thistle not, you know not that it was ever that serious but you know now I can really kind of put this to bed and, and start yeah. you know, really writing and looking at the new record which I've already written you know I have about eight or nine demos for it uh, that I want to ship out and I think they're pretty different from some of the other stuff I've done in, in a multitude of ways. And, and I'm excited for that. It's going to be great. Well, you know, for us fans, it's great too, because we, we, we hear little previews of these songs. Like you said, I think it's, I, I just always prefer when a song doesn't remain static over time. I right. like when an artist says, well, let's try it this way. Let's try it that way. Let's do this. Let's do that. Because, you know, my, my good friend, my best friend, Randy, who is a prolific songwriter, producer, so that, you know, does all like this one plays. He says, what you basically do is you write a song, then you record the song, and then you figure out how the hell you're going to do it live. So you're basically sort right. of doing a cover version of your own song, right? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, there's never been a time I haven't, you know, people. The question I always get is like, oh, now that you know, 
down the line's been out for three years or, or the half life that's been out for seven months or whatever. Yeah. You know, are there things that you would do differently? And and it's just always such a funny question to me because like I will you know, I will get in, you know, if the studio session ends at eight o'clock, I will get in my car at eight oh one and go, Oh, I should have sang that differently. <laughs> Time has nothing to do with it. Yeah. The second the words leave my mouth, I wish I said them different. So yeah. um I really, I, I've always loved playing live. That's always been something I've gravitated towards. And so I'm always excited to figure out how to do it. And it's also a really great challenge because, you know, typically my band, it's it's myself on guitar or piano, depending on what is most predominantly in the song. Uh, a second guitar doing background vocals, a drummer and a bassist. So for Ghosted Road, when we did that, it was super easy when we play that yeah. live. That's what that is. Okay, we missed a little bit of organ, but whatever, who cares? Um, but, but, but now when we're sitting down to do you know, uh, half beats, nothing or, or uh, Brooklyn can wait. Like suddenly that becomes a challenge on how are yeah. we putting this song together and are we using tracks and wh- what am I doing? And, you know, <laughs> so it, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. It, it's fun. Um, that was, I think, I think the hardest, the, the biggest challenge was, um, I guess Brooklyn can wait because it was, I have to play guitar on it Yeah, because it was that driving acoustic but there's also a lot of piano work in it. And yep. uh, I could also have played piano on it. And so that's always the challenge is figuring out what I'm going to do and, and how I can manage to put that all together nicely, uh, you know, so that the audience hears something a little different, but still kind of what they're expecting. What you got to do is you just got to play the strum the pattern. And then when it gets a diddle in, just like leave right. that ring it open, just play that with your right hand quickly back to the guitar. You could do it. That's I'm right. sure you could do it. Yeah. <laughs> So at some point I'll have to bite the bullet and add a piano player, but yeah, it's called Ben Mon. He's sitting around in California doing nothing. I'm sure he'll come yeah. out, right? <laughs> I drew it. <laughs> okay, well, look, thanks so much for jumping on again, man. I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of this album. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm looking forward to whatever comes next. I'm looking forward to the live album and the next album that comes out after that. And like I said, in 20 years, when uh, it's time to do J- a, convers- a conversation with Jake Thistle, give me a call because I want dibs on that. So, <laughs> All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This is such a blast. Let people know where they can find you on social media, what's the website, all those kinds of things. Sure, yeah. I'm at uh, jakethistle.com, which is kind of, uh, you know, the, the link to everything you need. And then it's uh, Jake Thistle on Facebook, Jake Thistle Music on Instagram. Uh, so chances are if you put my name and maybe music after that, you'll find me wherever, you know. Find you somewhere. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks for doing this, man. We'll speak to you later. I can't wait. Thank you. <laughs>